Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. I'm Scott Williams, and today we are speaking with Captain Matthew Paradise, who is a former Navy SEAL, now turned fighter pilot and carrier captain, uh, doing fantastic things after he left the team. Good morning, Captain. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here this morning. So, sir, I was noticing in your uh, biography that you came into the Navy in 1985 and went to BUDS. Uh, you graduated with Class 138, and then from there you went to SEAL Team 2. But before you went to SEAL Team 2, I wanted to talk a little bit about your, your BUDS training experience. Um, what was that like going through BUDS training back in the 80s? It was, uh, you know, I didn't, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know a whole heck of a lot uh, about uh, what it took to become a SEAL. Uh, certainly, uh, I knew a little bit about uh, what to expect when I got to a SEAL team, but it wasn't uh, as highly publicized as it is today, certainly. And so, you know, I was, before I went to BUDS, I was on a ship stationed here in San Diego, the USS Tripoli, and, you know, I, I felt strongly that uh, I wanted to be a SEAL. And getting there was just a matter of, you know, getting in good shape and showing up and doing my best. Did you find that um, you made a lot of friends while you were going through training? Or was it really just, uh, I just need to survive every day and get to the finish line? Oh, uh, no, it was, it was uh, all about teamwork. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, it's, you know, I, I really consider BUDS as one of the formative periods in my life. Uh, and I, I learned how to be a good friend and how to be a good teammate in BUDS. And I would say, you know, I probably didn't start off as a very good teammate, uh, but I certainly learned how to do it. And uh, I made friendships there that have lasted to this day. You know, um, a lot of people talk about the different personalities that come to light when you go through training, especially the really difficult training like like Hell Week, um, San Clemente Island, you know, diving. And they say that the guys who are going to stick it out are the guys who find a way to keep working with their teammates and and look past, you know, perceived weaknesses and just pull together as a team. What would you say is probably, from your perspective, the best advice for a young man who's getting ready to uh, consider entering the seal or swick pipeline good question let's see so I think the first thing I would say is uh, you, you're not gonna you're not gonna get through the training alone uh, there's they're gonna they're gonna find your weaknesses and they're gonna exploit those weaknesses and you're gonna have to rely on uh, on your team members uh, both in training and uh, you know when you when you become operational to, uh, to band together uh, and to get things done as a team. Uh, I would also say that you, you have to have a sense of perspective. Uh, the folks that uh, I went through training with uh, that got too caught up in the moment uh, were the folks that would you know ring the bell and uh, if you can take a step back from whatever it is you're going through at the, the specific time and understand that uh, it's something that you're going through and in a couple hours it's going to be better and you're moving on to the next, the next evolution uh, and to not take everything uh, so to heart. And in other words, you know, you might, you might not be doing very well at a, good, at a specific evolution, but uh, you rely on your, your teammates to help you get through. And, you know, a couple hours later, they might be leaning on your shoulder. Uh, and the other thing that I would say is you got, you got to kind of have a sense of humor. Uh, if you don't have the ability to laugh at yourself uh, at all the crazy stuff that you're going through, uh, then it's going to be a lot harder. Now, I, 
we talk about that teamwork. We talk about bonding together. You went off to SEAL Team 2. That's on the East Coast. And you made your first deployments over to Northern Europe as a mountain and Arctic warfare specialist. That's not something that is uh, really common. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? You bet. So uh, I showed up at SEAL Team 2. And, uh, uh, you know, back then, uh, you, you did the STT sort of locally on, on the individual coast. And uh, as I was going through STT and doing all of that training, uh, I heard about a platoon that was forming up, and it was a Mountain Antarctic Warfare platoon. And so I talked to that platoon commander. Uh, I grew up in the Northwest, uh, so lots of lots of outdoor activities, climbing, hiking, hunting, fishing, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, time in the mountains. And so uh, I really wanted to be in that platoon. I kind of knew a little bit about that. I, I really enjoyed it. And so uh, when the platoon formed up, uh, I, I was you know, put in that platoon and it was, it was terrific. Yeah, that's quite an experience, um, I got to say, because most people think that uh, the job kind of boils down to uh, becoming a tough guy and then going out to the desert and shooting someone. But it's uh, it's really got a lot more to do with that. Um, it truly is a sea, air and land experience. Um, and you got to experience uh, some unusual environments. Absolutely. Uh, we did uh, we did training in, uh, you know, the mountains of New York, in the mountains of Colorado, in the mountains of Washington State. Uh, we went up to Goose Bay, Labrador uh, to do a lot of, you know, pretty, pretty cold weather training. And then uh, certainly uh, once we deployed to Northern Europe, uh, lots of stuff uh, pretty far north, uh, some of it above the Arctic Circle, lots of uh, skiing, shooting. Uh, it was it's uh, it's pretty terrific uh, platoon to be in. What would you say was uh, the best part about team life? Well, you know, I that's a tough question. There were so many great things about it, but I, I guess if I had to choose one, it was it was the platoon itself. Just living and working with a bunch of uh, like-minded hard charging individuals, you know, that you could literally rely on with your life uh, and sometimes did. Uh, that uh, platoon experience just created a bond and, you know, you got done with every day and, uh, you know, I would go to bed thinking, you know, I really did something today. What would you say, um, what would you say it was about your experience in the teams that made you want to get a commissioning and become a naval aviator? So, you know, what, as I mentioned before, uh, I, I really look back at BUDS as kind of a formative experience in my life. And, uh, you know, prior to BUDS, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, do anything particularly well, to be completely honest. Uh, you know, a little bit of time in school, a little bit of time at odd jobs, uh, but, Going through buds and getting into a platoon, uh, it it really demonstrated that uh, with a lot of hard work, uh, pretty much anything was possible. And it uh, buds and then being in a platoon really expanded my horizon of what was possible. And uh, you know, by the time I was done with the, the deployment, and uh, I was really it was like you know I could do anything I set my mind to. And so that, that uh, led to uh, an application for the enlisted commissioning program. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get accepted for that. Went back to uh, University of Washington up in Seattle. And unlike my first attempt there, it went much, much better because uh, you know, I had a lot more uh, understanding of what it takes to get through something. Much, much uh, greater ability to to knuckle down and do the hard work. And uh, coming out of uh, University of Washington, having the, uh, the opportunity to go to the aviation pipeline, uh, which is something I kind of always wanted to do, it seemed like uh, a natural segue from the teams to, to move on to the next challenge. So 
What was it like to get into uh, the cockpit for the first time and uh, fly uh, a tactical jet? Uh, it was it was pretty special. You know, there's uh, you, you get to Pensacola and uh, there's a lot of ground training uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of work to do before you climb into the F-18 for the first time. And uh, I'll never forget my first flight uh, in the front seat of an F-18, uh, lighting the afterburners and, uh, and heading out to the training range. Uh, it was uh, the culmination of a lot of hard work, and it was pretty special. And not to mention the the cats and the traps, right? Absolutely. That uh, the and you know that's that's another big sort of a uh, milestone in an aviator's career, a carrier aviator's career at least. Uh, you know, when you go to the aircraft carrier for the first time, you're alone. There's no instructor in the back seat, and uh, and you've obviously trained. Uh, very, very hard for it, but uh, the, that pinnacle event is yours and yours alone, and uh, that was pretty special as well. I, I can just imagine, uh, I, I would break out in a sweat when I saw that flight deck approaching. It looks like the size of a postage stamp and then think I'm going to land on that. Yeah, it was, it was pretty stressful for sure, but, you know, again, it was, uh, you, I, I can relate back to all the training that I did in the teams. You know, you work super hard, and and when you're when you get into those extremely stressful situations, and you're on stem power, uh, you know that you have the ability and the training to back up, uh, you know, whatever it is you're about to do, and that gets you through those initial very nervous moments, uh, and then somewhere, you know, along in my career, it became less stressful and more fun, uh, at least during the daytime. I wouldn't ever say that my night traps were ever particularly fun uh but but uh yeah you you get you you do the training you get through it for sure it sounds like uh quite a career of uh, adrenaline rushes y you know uh there's a i i guess so i mean i i certainly didn't plan it like that um but i sort of grab you know being a, a team guy that's certainly there's a lot of uh, adrenaline inducing activities there and uh, there are certainly times in the cockpit where that's the case too. Uh, but it's not something that I think I ever uh, specifically planned for or, or charted out. It's just kind of the way it worked out. And then the next turn is that uh, you're in the squadrons long enough and then you're leading them and all of a sudden, uh, hey, you get selected for command and we need to send you to nuke school. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So after, you know, essentially a career in naval aviation uh, culminating in uh, the squadron, the, you know, the tour as a commanding officer of an F-18 squadron, uh, I was selected for nuclear power. And uh, it's really uh, like a, a whole nother career. And so I would, if I tell people I've had three or four careers in the Navy, uh, really, and this was a, a very big pivot. So uh, you know, you get, you finish up with being the commanding officer in charge of an entire squadron, a bunch of F-18s, and uh, then you find yourself in the classroom with a bunch of, bunch of uh, ensigns and JGs, and uh, you're just grinding on equations and trying to learn uh, everything there is to know about nuclear power and the reactors, and that's a pretty humbling experience. A lot of those guys were a lot smarter than I was. Uh, and I found myself once again falling back on the habits that I developed in the teams. And that was just a lot of hard work. Yeah, I'm sure that hard work um, <laughs> really uh, was required. I mean, you also have your degrees from University of Washington in electrical engineering and, and your master's for, of, uh, uh, in systems engineering from Johns Hopkins. Um, th those aren't exactly lightweight schools. Well, yeah, so... The University of Washington piece was, you know, when I, I grew up in, like I said, in Washington State, grew up in Tacoma, went to University of Washington the first time, uh, right out of high school. And, you know, that was, that was uh, a failure, to be honest. Uh, I had a great time in college, but, uh, but I, I uh, didn't do a lot of study, to be completely honest. Um, and so when I went back to University of Washington the second time, uh, much better prepared, 
uh, I was I was very focused on making sure I got the most out of that time there, and uh, and then I just had an opportunity when I was uh, stationed in Pax River, uh, up in Maryland, to enroll in in Johns Hopkins, uh, and the systems engineering program seemed like a natural uh, fit for me uh, for what I was doing there in Pax River at the time. Now it uh, it says in your bio that you reported. Uh, as the CEO of USS Carl Vinson in June 2018. And here we are a little over two years later. What's that last two years been like for you? Uh, it, it, it's, been, uh, it's been terrific. It's certainly, uh, you know, probably the best, the best tour that I've had. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work uh, with some of the, the best men, men and women that I have that I have ever met in, uh, you know, my 34, 35 year career. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a lot more like the teams than you would think. Um, you know, lots of, lots of, uh, uh you know, 20 different departments, uh, all, uh, kind of their own entity, almost like their own little command. And, uh, they are, they are manned and led by a lot of hard chargers and, you know, there's a lot of complicated things that happen on an aircraft carrier, and it's all got to work together in synchronicity uh, before you're you're able to launch and recover an aircraft. And it's just pretty awe-inspiring uh, to be associated with that whole effort. Yeah, I can imagine it. Uh, I mean, I've been on carriers before twice, uh, Carl Vinson and, and Nimitz. In fact, uh, that was my first and last commands uh, afloat in the Navy. And um, it, they really are floating cities. Everything has to work together. You, you get to know the, the folks in in your department and your sort of a, your own neighborhood, and um, the the bustle above and below decks is is just amazing. And and visitors always are amazed when they come to the ships to to find that you know sailors know their jobs and everything seems to work like clockwork. Absolutely, it's uh, it's great. If you ever have an opportunity, uh, it's it's tough these days. But if you ever have an opportunity to go check out an aircraft carrier, particularly uh, one at sea launching and recovering aircraft, then I would absolutely jump on that opportunity. It's pretty neat. It's a pretty neat thing. Yeah, there's nothing like it. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and it's kind of a focus of the SEAL and SWIC communities these days. And it, we're taking a hard look um, and kind of refocusing on the fundamental values of character. Yep. And, and you've had a broad experience now in and out of the teams. Um, we know that technical proficiency is great, but how important is having the right kind of character? Uh, it, it's, uh, it's every bit, if not more important than your technical skills, right? The way, the way I look at it is that it's that second axis of uh, your skill set, right? You, uh, the, the first axis is your skill as an operator or whatever it is you're doing, uh, your body of knowledge and your experience. Uh, the other axis, which is equally, if not more important, is, you know, the, the character, the trust uh, that you have uh, developed with your other teammates. And uh, you can be the best operator in the world, but if people don't trust you, and really the trust comes from that character, right? Doing what you're saying you're going to do, uh, being reliable, being honest, being trustworthy, uh, integrity. Uh, if uh, if you don't bring that to the game, then uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna be an effective team member, and so it's it's critically important. That's well said. Hey, Captain, um, I really appreciate you joining us today and providing some perspective on what it's like to begin in the teams and to take your vision and your skills moving forward to have a career in the Navy that has spanned now over three decades and uh, continue your great service, sir. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. And uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks, sir. You bet. There is nowhere to hide in Hell Week, gents. If you've been skating through bugs so far, you will not do so any longer. Get your butt down. Get off your knees.